This week's number, $220 billion. That's a total cost of hosting the World Cup in Qatar this year. It will be the most expensive World Cup ever. No shocker there. For context, the World Cup in Brazil in 2014 cost just $15 billion. I have two tickets to the World Cup, but I just found out it's the day of my anniversary. So if anyone would like to go in my place, just let me know. Her name is Susan, and we have reservations at Granger's. Welcome to Property Markets. Today, we're discussing Elon's Twitter upheaval so far, Uber and Airbnb's earnings, and the pain in the Chinese markets. Here with the news is Property Media Analyst Ed Elson. Ed, what is the good word, my brother? I just wanted to say it's a very special day at Prof G Media. Happy birthday, Scott. Thank you, Ed. And we should also point out that I thought it was my birthday yesterday. I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> and put out a tweet and was feeling sorry for myself because my family had called me and then recognized uh, that it was, uh, in fact, not my birthday. <laughs> so I think that's what it means to get old. I think that's fitting that you start forgetting which day is your birthday. How old are you, Anyways, 27? thank you. No, no, Ed. I just turned 41. Oh, okay. Good. And naked, I look 40 and 7 eighths. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just, uh, how old am I? Fucking old is how old I am. <laughs> Anyways, get to the news. I don't want to talk about my birthday. Okay. Let's start with our weekly review of market vitals. The S&P 500 fell after the Fed indicated interest rate hikes would continue. The dollar moved higher. Bitcoin fell slightly. And the yield on 10-year treasuries rose again, remaining elevated above 4%. Shifting to the headlines. Amazon's market value fell below $1 trillion for the first time since the pandemic. The stock declined 6% on Tuesday, erasing almost all of its pandemic gains. The company also announced a hiring freeze across its corporate workforce, citing macroeconomic conditions. Meanwhile, Lyft and Stripe are reducing their headcounts by 13 and 14% respectively. There's that Patagonia recession you were talking about last week. And as expected, the Fed raised interest rates by 75 basis points for the fourth time this year. The Fed funds rate is now at its highest level since January 2008. And Fed Chair Jerome Powell said rate hikes will continue, but indicated a slowdown could be imminent. At some point, as I've said in the last two press conferences, uh, it will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases as we approach the level of interest rates that will be sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to our 2% goal. There is significant uncertainty around that level of interest rates. Even so, we still have some ways to go. And incoming data since our last meeting suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. The Bank of England also delivered a rate hike of 75 basis points the following day. That's its largest increase since 1989. Scott, any thoughts? Yeah, well, you're just uh, today in the markets, um, you saw growth stocks get hammered again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerome Powell or Chairman Powell is, you know, he's come to play. He's not messing around. And there's some, we were talking last week about parsing language. Um, so ha saying we still have some way to go is, you know, pretty aggressive language. And also that if you'll no, he said, since our last meeting suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. In other words, you know, uh, pedal meet metal. They're mm -hmm. not slowing down. And I think growthy stocks that are especially susceptible to interest rates have, again, uh, really taken it in the short. So why do we care or why do growth stocks get hit harder? Because uh, you're basically betting on the future. Growth stocks are valued based on future cash flows, which are worth less in a high interest rate environment because you have to discount those cash flows in the future back at a higher discount rate. In addition, if they're growth companies, they still need to raise capital oftentimes, and it's more expensive to buy that capital. So their future cash flows are worth less, and their current business costs more to finance, thereby hitting their equity value. But you're seeing it across tech right now. It's getting hit pretty hard. And any reflections on those layoffs at Lyft and Stripe and Amazon's hiring freeze, this is kind of exactly what you predicted, I think, a year ago you said this, right? Or maybe eight or nine months ago? Yeah, somewhere around, somewhere between six and 12 months. Look, it, we're just getting started. And 
Uh, this was an easy prediction. When you see SG&A at these companies up two and three X over the last two or three years, I mean, they've literally been doubling their expenses every kind of 24 to 36 months. Could you briefly explain and, SG&A? SG&A stands for sales, general, and administrative costs. Basically, in a growth company, means people. And uh, it's kind of the cost before what's called a CapEx investment, which is usually an investment in planned property or equipment. So I think of in a growth company, SG&A is basically the cost to house and uh, hire and pay people. And in a tech company or a growth company, the majority of your costs are SG&A. You know, Meta's primary cost or biggest expense line is going to be its people, the same with Pinterest, the same with Snap. And they've been hiring like crazy. And what you have is... People never want to acknowledge that they're getting older, and I have up close and personal experience with this over the last 48 hours, and that is we'll inject ourselves full of Botox, and we refuse to believe that it's not a good idea for us to play the father-son basketball game and go up, and our knee reminds us that you are, in fact, you know, old. And you have companies that like to think they're going to be teenagers forever. And if you look at Meta and Google, they're no longer growth companies. Their revenue is flat meaning that they are mature companies, but their decision-making and their view of themselves and their reflection in the mirror, they still think they're teenagers, and they keep acting like growth companies, keep investing, keep growing, thinking that they can reignite that growth. And maybe they can, but these are now, I think, officially mature companies. So what does it mean when your SG&A has doubled and your revenue is flat? It means layoffs. We are going to see hundreds of thousands uh, Patagonia Vess uh, looking for a home over the next six months. We're just getting started here, Ed. So what's the alternative for a company like Meta and Google? I mean, you're describing that they're too old, that they need to recognize that they're too mature, but do you just admit defeat and say, okay, we're not going to grow anymore? I mean, what should they be doing? So that's an interesting question. First, you have to acknowledge where you are in the life cycle. And that's not to say that you give up and just put you know, the company on an ice flow or say, you know, make Nana comfortable and let her just drift off into death. I'm not saying that, but uh, slow your hiring, uh, become an adult and start returning capital to shareholders. These companies be, are wildly profitable. And when they slow down their CapEx because they can't justify the return they're going to get on at incremental CapEx because the market's no longer lifting them up and are want more to spend more on search or on social, you can return a lot of money to shareholders. Mm -hmm. Mature companies that slow down their investment in CapEx and slow down their growth in SGA can be real cash spigots. Mm -hmm. And you can return money to shareholders through dividends or stock buybacks. You also look for acquisitions. You also look for opportunities to find growth. But you have a sober conversation and say, okay, we're no longer teenagers, and it's time for us to slow down our expenditures. We're, not, we're no longer a growth company, so we can't uh, justify continued investment at this pace. And the good news is we'll start spewing cash that we can return to shareholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess they could, have been, they could have been investing, instead of investing in the metaverse, they could have been investing in dividends or stock buybacks, and that probably would have played better for the stock in the end, is sort of what you're saying, right? If Mark Zuckerberg had taken the money he's invested so far in Reality Labs and the money he's planning to spend and used it for stock buybacks, or announce a dividend, I think the stock would probably be double where it is right now. Wow. I like that take. Okay, let's move on to our first story. After just one week of owning the company, Elon Musk is already shaking things up at Twitter. Musk has fired the CEO, Parag Agarwal, as well as the CFO and the general counsel. And at least five other executives have left, including the chief marketing officer and the head of product. Elon has also proposed many changes, including mass layoffs, as we discussed last week, enabling video paywalls similar to OnlyFans, bringing back Vine, that's the short-form video app that Twitter shut down in 2016, and charging users $8 per month for the blue check. The blue check is a symbol that a user is verified, i.e. a celebrity or a journalist. But under the paid model, Elon said blue check users will also get access to exclusive features. And crucially, he believes this will help solve the bot problem. Scott, you've been saying Twitter should switch to a paid model for years now. So I assume you like what Elon's doing? There's a lot to like here. So first off, just coming up with new innovative or being open to new innovative ideas and trying to you know, jab the corpus with a big uh, you know, EpiPen or shot of adrenaline is probably good for the company right now. I think paywalls or different types of paywalls, I think they should and can take a lot of business away from a great business called OnlyFans. Um, one of the great strategic errors in the history of tech was probably Twitter 
closing down Vine. Mm-hmm. Vine was uh, TikTok before TikTok was TikTok. Uh, and also a, a blue check or subscription fee makes a lot of sense. They're just going about it incorrectly. And that is they should segment it. What do I mean by that? Uh, to charge everyone with a blue check eight bucks, it doesn't make a lot of sense because there's some people that actually, as my co-host Kara Swisher says, paint their fence, and that is they provide content, or a nonprofit that it might be a real might be real cabbage. So, a way of sort of uh, you know, I think AOC tweeted, "Mr. Free Speech wants to help liberate people from censorship by charging people eight bucks a month," and kind of there was a bit of a tussle between the two of them anyways and that makes for of course the twitter algorithm likes that but i think the key here is segmentation now, what do we mean by that and that is some sort of algorithm and it might involve this incredible algorithm called the human brain that assesses the economic surplus not being captured so when caitlin jenner gets four hundred thousand dollars for a promoted tweet i think it's entirely fair for twitter to say similar to apple we're going to take 30 percent of that when they look at what we do and say that your Twitter feed uh, creates a lot of business or awareness that results in speaking fees or book fees, we're going to charge you $100, 200 $1,000 a month. A journalist, uh, a company, a nonprofit, someone, a humorist that adds a lot of value, creates a lot of content, you know, maybe you don't charge them. You have to make, there's going to have to be a judgment call here, but a one price or one size fits all is the wrong strategy, just as Airlines charge wildly different prices for the same seat on the same plane, but it's worth different amounts to different people at different times. They're going to have to show more savvy around value. In other words, some some accounts should literally, you could probably for certain accounts charge them $100,000 a month and they would decide to pay it. Others should be free. How much would you pay? So generally speaking, there's consumer dissonance. People will say they will pay less or more than they actually would. I think that if they charged us a hundred to a thousand dollars a month, it would be difficult, even at a thousand dollars a month, and I think that would create a lot of resentment amongst Prof G employees, if you will. But I think if they said, all right, to maintain a direct line of communication with a half a million people that you want to be cognizant of your work, to hire you for or give you opportunities to invest or um, bring some sunlight to your research or create awareness for your speaking gigs or your books or whatever it might be, in general enjoyment, I think we would probably pay a thousand bucks a month. And, and that's I think for prob- the blue check or for being on Twitter? For being on Twitter. I okay. think that verification, identification, or you could add you know, additional features or maybe say my content gets elevated above other people's content, whatever it might be. They could come up with a series of features to try and justify it. But at the end of the day, the pricing should be based on some sort of assessment of the economic surplus they are not can based on the economic surplus they are not capturing and they should take 10 20 30 percent mm-hmm. of that economic value that they are no that they are not capturing what do you see as the purpose of the blue check I mean th- I feel like I've seen a lot of arguments about this on Twitter a lot of people don't care and I find that the people that don't care are the, are the people who already have a blue check um, I think Cara Swisher said that she doesn't care um, but when I look at the blue check, to me, it's a signal of status, um, of influence, of fame. I take people who have blue checks next to their names more seriously. And it feels like if you say you can just pay for it, then it, you sort of lose the status associated with the blue check. Do you agree with that? I think you're exactly right. I think there is real status here and people you know, people poo-poo it. But the reality is it's sort of the lowest budget knighting in the digital world. And it says that you have influence, a certain level of followers. They have verified that you, you're who you say you are. I do think it's a status symbol. And I think almost everyone who has a blue check should pay for it. I think almost everyone who has it and pays for it should probably not pay $8. They should either pay less or a lot more. So this one size fits all doesn't make, in my view, um, any sense. What's also interesting is supposedly Elon is on a charm offensive and is uh, meeting with the biggest advertisers. I heard from an individual who runs the media buying department for one of the largest advertisers in the nation and said that Elon's on this bro charm offensive and his ideas were ads as content, subscription as a bot killer. I do think if you start charging people, you'll have fewer bots. Uh, what I don't understand, though, is it seems to me that you have to charge everyone to get bots, mm-hmm. uh, to get rid of bots. So I don't understand what charging the blue check or the most popular people would do for bots. Uh, but he's out there talking about um, 
subscription and reducing the bots, basically everything we said they should do and he claimed that he wasn't going to do. So, mm -hmm. But he's on a charm offense. I can't imagine how bad business is there right now. I would think it's just fallen off a cliff. So many of their salespeople have left. I think a lot of advertisers have hit pause. Interpublic Group or IPG, one of the biggest ad agency conglomerates, has asked all of their, suggested all of their clients press pause. I think in a recessionary environment, a lot of advertisers are looking for an excuse to spend less across any platform, much less a platform that is incurring this sort of tumult. So I don't know if the debt will force him to release numbers, but I got to imagine business has literally fallen off a cliff mm -hmm. uh, in the last several months. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about that $8 number? Um, he originally proposed $20 a month for the blue check, whatever that will mean. Um, but then Stephen King tweeted out, quote, $20 a month to keep my blue check. Fuck that. They should pay me. And then Elon responded, how about $8? And then apparently decided that that was the number. Do you think that he just pulled that out of thin air, or do you think that's a calculated number, or what do you think of that number? Like with most things, Elon, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think he makes a lot of decisions from his gut. Um, you know, I think he has a world-class gut. It would be hard to argue that his business instincts aren't outstanding, uh, at least around traditional business. I think his communications and some of his judgment is uh, sort of on par with a nine-year-old, <laughs> if a nine-year-old lack grace. Mm -hmm. But uh, he has great, you know, there's just no doubt about it. He has great business instincts. But I don't know if they did any A-B testing. But again, it should be variable pricing based on the number of followers or some sort of assessment or link to economic value. A guy like Stephen King, I mean, does he get a lot? I mean, who gets more? Does the network get more value or does he get more value? And it's probably the latter, which means his account, an author, a journalist, should probably get a free account. Uh, but at the end of the day, if he's using it, to promote his book and have a presence, I think you can make an argument to charge him. But the sort of one size fits all number is just hard to justify. Uh, but I'm, I'm a fan of charging. I think advertising, the ad model is largely pioneered by Sheryl Sandberg, and I don't think she meant to do this, has been an enormous negative uh, for society because it teaches the algorithms to keep people engaged and the best way to engage them is to enrage them. And it's just taken our discourse and made it much more coarse. So I'm a big fan of any movement towards paying for content. Uh, I'd be interested to know if there's an opportunity for the creators to actually make money. I think that's going to be the next generation of social is someone's going to figure out a model where if someone goes on a great comedian and does constant great content or if Nicholas Kristoff or uh, uh, Casey Newton or someone uh, starts posting their content similar to a Substack that you can tip them or get paid for it. So I think that should be a marketplace where people spend money and uh, uh, on creators, uh, Twitter or the network gets a cut of it, but also that they charge people who are, uh, again, getting huge economic value and Twitter isn't capturing any of it. So uh, quite frankly, the $8 a month hubbub right now just isn't worth it because if every currently verified user, and that's 400,000 accounts signed up and paid $8 a month, that would generate just $40 million a year. That doesn't move the needle for them. But if 10% of Twitter's 238 million daily active users paid, uh, and I think they should pay more, or an average of, call it 10 bucks, they'd get an incremental two and a half billion. That's a game changer. So the bottom line is they need to charge, and the blue check will largely indicate somebody who's capturing a lot of value or creating a lot of value. And they'll have either, they'll either make the most money, although they're not talking about sharing any of this money with content creators, or they'll pay the most. But it shouldn't be limited to blue check. That doesn't, I don't understand that as a segmentation strategy. Again, it should be the people with the most followers who are garnering the most economic value if they want to move the needle here. You mentioned earlier that they're sort of stealing business from OnlyFans with this idea. Could you explain a little further what you mean there? I think OnlyFans is a great business, and I think there's a large segment of the population that doesn't want to be associated with OnlyFans, and that is they would be embarrassed. Um, I think it's a safe assumption to assume that your entire credit card history will be made public someday. And having a charge for whatever it is, 20, 30, 100 bucks or whatever you spend uh, that says OnlyFans or whatever the, the merchant uh, identification is that is OnlyFans is probably not something people are uh, excited to do. But if it was seamless and sort of present on Twitter, I think adult content is a huge business. I think OnlyFans is a great business. It's kind of opened up a lot of job opportunities for people or ways to make money that 
I'm sure some people don't agree with or find offensive. I think people should get to do whatever the heck they want with their own bodies. And if they make money, good for them. Uh, so uh, Twitter has such u- ubiquity. And if they built the technology that made it easy, built in a micropayments platform, I think it's a, I think it's one of those niche businesses that's highly profitable, a great business that they or someone else should absolutely be in. But it seems to me that's kind of a natural fit for a social network like Twitter, a kind of a business that they should be in. Hmm. Okay, let's move on to our second story. We saw earnings from two big sharing economy platforms last week, Airbnb and Uber, and both beat expectations. Airbnb posted record quarterly revenues of $2.9 billion, that's up 29% from a year ago. Earnings came in at $179 per share versus $147 expected. However, the company also fell short on its guidance. It projects around $1.8 billion in revenue next quarter, while Wall Street expected $1.85 billion. Airbnb shares fell around 10% as a result. Now, Scott, we'll get to Uber in a minute, but let's just focus on Airbnb for now. I know that you're a long-term shareholder in the company. I know you like the company. So what do you think of this? Were you impressed with these earnings? Yeah, I would argue right now Airbnb is one of the best performing companies in the world. You have two types of companies. You have very profitable companies such as a Meta or a Google uh, or a Microsoft that have kind of low growth. Uh, Apple is at 8%, which is super impressive, but they're kind of flat to single-digit growth. Then you have high-growth companies like an Uber that still lose money. So it's not easy to find a company that does over a billion dollars in revenue and is profitable and is growing more than 20, and in this case, more than 30, almost 30% a year. So I would argue the air is pretty thin up here. There just aren't a lot of people performing the way Airbnb is. Now, the question is, why did why have shares fallen 20% in the last couple trading days? I think interest rates uh, hurt a company like this. Mm-hmm. I think the fear of a recession, when interest rates go up, if a recession comes, people are, seem to be ripping through their savings, which means they'll likely decrease their discretionary spend, which you think would probably hurt Airbnb. They took their guidance down, which spooked everybody. And I think the markets are just looking for a reason to hit growth stocks and take them down to kind of multiples or more traditional multiples. And while Airbnb is sort of the fastest tortoise, if you will, it also is getting its turn at the woodshed. And I think this shows more than anything that market dynamics trump individual performance. It's mm-hmm. hard to find anything bad in these earnings, and yet the stock's been taken down 20%. So it got hit really hard. Do you think the market reacted incorrectly? I mean, you mentioned that there might be a recession, sort of these macro conditions that could hurt Airbnb, but it also seems like those conditions can hurt any company. I mean, why why is Airbnb being singled out here? You know, that's that's an interesting question. I wouldn't have, the day before earnings, I thought that there was a decent chance. I knew it was going to be volatile, but I thought it was more likely to be volatile to the upside. They had record revenue of $2.9 billion, That's up 29%. They had record profits of $1.2 billion, That's up 46%. And also, when we look at the earnings call, the transcript, uh, Brian Chesky used the term record five times in his earnings call. And the fixed costs are lower due to COVID restructuring. He had a great line. He said that we've gone from being the Navy to the Navy SEALs, a small, lean, elite group. I thought that was fantastic. I thought the markets were going to like this earnings call, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, the marketing costs are low. More than 90% of customers come directly to the site. I think this is a huge overlooked attribute of Airbnb, and that is Meta and Google essentially have a stranglehold on anyone who wants to acquire customers online. You have to go through them. They pitch you against each other in this genius uh, bidding and auction format such that sometimes Meta and Google get 30, 50, 60 percent of the margin for a new customer or that you you get or you recognize as the company for a new customer. As a matter of fact, by some estimates, Amazon, Meta, and Google uh, receive 40 percent of all venture funding. So who do venture capitalists fund? They fund businesses that are largely online. Those companies immediately start spending money to acquire customers online, which means they go to the three toll booths of Amazon, Meta and Google. So what do you know? If you invest $100 in a VC fund, 40 of those dollars are going to one of those three firms. And what has Airbnb been able to do? They've been able to escape the stranglehold. People go direct to the site, Airbnb, so they don't have to pay this toll uh, for 90% of their business. The result of that 
is that their margins are much greater. They have 41% net margins. Expedia has negative margins. They had a loss. Booking.com had 20%, and Marriott had 13%. So Airbnb has triple the margins of Marriott, and it's largely because they are online but don't have to pay these massive kind of monopoly-like toll booths. Mm -hmm. They also have incredible cash reserves, $12 billion in cash versus $8 billion in Expedia. Bookings.com also has $12 billion. Marriott just has half a billion. Uh, but it's just uh, there's just no doubt about it. All of these companies have taken a hit. Marriott's only down 2%, not considered a growth company, doesn't need additional cash flow. Bookings is off 25%, and Airbnb has been cut in half. It's off 45%. Now, a lot of this, you asked about why it's come down. Airbnb, by many metrics, looked expensive. Its price to sales was about 10x. It's probably down to 8 or 9x. Bookings is at 5x, and Marriott is at 3x. So what you have is a bit of a normalization where the people have said, okay, Airbnb is an amazing company. There's no denying that. But should it be trading at twice the multiple of Bookings and three times Marriott? And I think the marketplace has said no. It deserves a premium, but not this level of premium. But I really like it here. I'm not selling any stock. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is an amazing company. And I, was, I already think that Airbnb is the best brand in the history of travel and hospitality. And I don't see who's the number two to Airbnb. What is it, VRBO? It just seems like every number two is a distant number two. I like the leadership. I like the margins. I like the growth. They're profitable. I like the fact they've exited the stranglehold of Google and Meta. I'm just I'm very bullish on the company and mm. it remains my biggest investment. So do you feel like it's undervalued right now? I don't know if it's undervalued because that multiple is still pretty strong. Mm-hmm. What I am comfortable with saying is I like it as a long-term hold. Yeah. I think to own the biggest and best profitable company that's growing 30% a year, I think eventually those metrics or those numbers grow into the valuation and take it up from here. So you know, don't do as I say, do as I do. I'm still holding. It's still my biggest position. I haven't sold any. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned that $12 billion of cash on the balance sheet. Do you think that they'll do anything with that? Do you think they'll reinvest it in the company, maybe a stock buyback? Do you think that maybe they'll acquire a company? It's an interesting question. I think if it grows, I mean, it'll probably grow to 15 or $20 billion over the next 12 or 24 months. The question is, what do they do with that cash? I would bet they use it for stock buybacks. Mm. The more interesting question would be, will they make an acquisition? Mm -hmm. What is to Airbnb what Whole Foods was to Amazon? And that is, would Airbnb ever go vertical? Would they ever acquire another hotel company? Mm. So the question is, is there an acquisition? Do they want to go vertical and be able to offer not only kind of vacation or sort of short-term rentals, but get into the actual hotel business? Because, Ed, there's a large market of people, and I'm, I'm part of this market, that want uh, a hotel or want the amenities and services. So I am in L.A. for five days. I check into the Beverly Hills Hotel, which is lovely, <laughs> which is lovely. And I want uh, room service, and I want a concierge to make reservations for me, and I want on-property restaurants that I know I'll get a table at, and I want someone setting up my chair um, with towels. God, I sound like a douchebag. <laughs> uh, but I think there's a large segment, a uh, large, very profitable segment, mostly business travels, but also people on uh, vacation that want a hotel and want the amenities of a hotel. So do they add those amenities in to an Airbnb experience similar to what they're doing? Or do they acquire some kind of sole purpose or single purpose properties known as hotels. I think mm. it'd be really interesting for them. I would predict in the next two to three years they make an acquisition in the physical mm. hotel space. Mm. Let's move on to Uber. Uh, Uber also had a really, really good quarter. The company posted $8.3 billion in revenue. That's a year on year increase of 72%. It also registered $1.2 billion in losses. A year ago, that number was $2.4 billion, So that's a big improvement. And unlike Airbnb, the market reacted well. Uber shares jumped more than 10% after the earnings call. What do you think of Uber as a company right now? So Uber's always been the company that's um, more promise than performance. Mm. And that is, it's never been profitable. uh, But it looks like the light at the end of the tunnel has been illuminated again, and it's brighter than it's ever been. And when I say the light at the end of the tunnel, that is the prospect of it becoming a profitable company. Revenues, as you said, up 72%. Net loss cut in half, so their scale is starting to reduce profits. And that's key because every time WeWork doubled in revenue, its losses kept pace with its revenue growth. It wasn't getting any scale. Here we Mm. see the net benefits of scale. 
that the company is growing 72%, and as a result of that growth, it's able to spread uh, its revenue across a fixed asset base, which means more is flowing to the bottom line or at least reducing the negative bottom line, and we saw their loss get cut in half. $512 million of the net loss was attributed to revaluations of Uber's equity investments and other ride-hailing companies, specifically China's Didi and Southeast Asia's Grab Holdings and self-driving startup Aurora Innovation. So if you net those out, it really lost around $700 million. Now that's starting to feel like a company when it does $8.3 billion, that's about 10% net loss, that if they can grow another 72% year on year, there's a shot, they go profitable. And that's what the market's looking for. Its gross bookings are up 26% year on year. Its monthly active users, 124 million, was up 14% year on year. And prices in September for a standard Uber and Lyft were 36% higher than they were in September of 2019. So it appears these companies have real pricing power. And I think we've all incurred or all sort of looked at our bill, our receipt for an Uber and said, wow, prices have gone up. Their freight revenue was $1.8 billion. That's up from $400 million a year ago, growth of 350%. That's impressive, uh, mostly due to the acquisition of TransPlace, a freight company. The stock reacted entirely different than Airbnb and popped 11% uh, before closing flat for the day. Uh, its market cap uh, is $56 billion. Lyft's market cap is $5 billion. Uber made eight times Lyft's revenue in the most recent quarter. Lyft is laying off 13% of staff. The, the most obvious observation, the easy layup prediction here, Ed, is that Lyft will not be an independent company within the next 12 months. Either Uber acquires it or another company looking for super app status or maybe an automobile company that wants to go vertical into um, ride hailing. Like a General Motors maybe thinks I, we can, for $6 billion, buy Lyft. And then we have kind of this vertical autonomous driving or vertical ride hailing company that just buys GM cars as a means of showing off our new electric vehicles. The obvious one here, though, is if the DOJ would clear it that Uber acquires Lyft. Lyft is Lyft should not be an independent company, and every day that goes on, its valuation is probably going to go down. Do you think there's actually a world in which the DOJ would not block it? Well, what Uber would claim is is that their competitive set or their sector isn't ride hailing, but transportation, and mm. that people have a lot of options. They would also say cabs and taxis, and I don't know what share of, if you call it ground transportation, that uh, Uber commands. And I think Uber would say you have to compare us against all of travel, that we only own, you know, 0.5% of travel revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ride hailing, they're obviously the big one. But does ride hailing also uh, include taxis? What about rental cars? What about cars? What about transportation in general? So I don't know if the DOJ would block this. I have the feeling that it would probably get through because Lyft – is becoming small and could go out of business if this keeps going. I haven't seen their numbers, mm -hmm. but this just shouldn't be an independent company. So I don't, I don't know what the DOJ, it's hard to predict. I haven't seen any consistency to what, what gets them upset and what doesn't. How, do you, how uh, would you feel about it? I mean, you're quite opinionated on antitrust. You have been in the past. Do you think it would be too anti-competitive? Do you think it's a monopoly if they acquire Lyft? Uh, you know, I, I don't, only because you think, well, okay, it's nice to have two competitors and you can play them off against each other to price check, but I don't think there's a lot of barriers of entry here. Mm -hmm. And I think you could, I use a I use a company in London called Wheelie because it has nicer cars. <laughs> the drivers I find are a little bit more professional. I just had a terrible experience with a driver where he couldn't figure out where in the Javits Center I was supposed to go. I mean, at some point, and I'm not exaggerating, I just literally got out and walked. And <laughs> what do you know? He's got only a 4.7 star rating on Uber. <laughs> um, and now it's like three. <laughs> and now it's three. But uh, yeah, I think this is a fairly competitive industry that doesn't have a lot of moats or barriers of entry. So I don't know if I would block. It feels to me like Lyft just goes away if somebody doesn't acquire it. So. I'd love, to th I'd love to know what Tim Wu thinks about this, but I don't immediately see this as the kind of thing that should be blocked. Yeah. You also mentioned their freight business. Here are just some numbers that I thought were pretty crazy. So this quarter, mobility, i.e. the taxiing, that made up 46% of revenue. Delivery, i.e. Uber Eats, was 33%. And freight was 21%. And last year, freight, in the same quarter last year, freight only made up 8%. Um, so it feels like this is a pretty massive business now, and maybe this is 
why Uber is suddenly on this path to profitability. What do you think of that of that unit of the freight business? Well, I think some of that was because of the acquisition, but it's really right. interesting. About 10 years ago at DLD, I got pilloried because I said that I thought a competitor to Amazon was Uber, that the big advantage of Amazon was last wow. mile delivery and that Uber would ultimately leverage their infrastructure and get into that. And it looks as if to a certain extent they are. And my friend <laughs> uh, Richard Kramer would say, who's a media and tech analyst, would say that Uber is a platform for connecting buyers and sellers. And right now it's mostly people who want to hail a car and, and drivers who own a car. But they're also getting into freight, right? They're also getting into people who want to buy food from a restaurant and have it delivered. So uh, this, was a, this was a staggering quarter for them. There's just no getting around it. And I've been very critical of Uber. I, I hope that they continue to get uh, hit hard for their classification of workers. Their workers should be classified, in my view, as employees. Mm -hmm. The good thing about this, or the hopeful thing about this that should help Uber and make it less of a mendacious company is that prices have gone up. Mm -hmm. And they have pricing power, which means they can pay their drivers more, which maybe means that a driver, when you adjust for the maintenance in gasoline, isn't making less than minimum wage, and that Uber isn't using... Uh, software and preying on people who may not have many other employment options to pay them substandard wages. So I think the price increase is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think you and your you and your posse should be taking Suburbans to the airport, Ed. Uh, I'd like to see more people. I think this should be more expensive. So mm -hmm. I think you have to give it to them. I think Dara Kastrashahi has done a really good job with the company in diversifying its revenue stream, maintaining growth. Um, so I, th I see Uber is less mendacious than I used to. Now it's just mendacious mm -hmm. with a small M, not a capital M. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they need to change anything significantly to reach profitability or just stay the course? Feels to me like they're on the right path. Yeah. If they can maintain that growth in freight and become uh, uh, you know, a company that has incredible logistics with their platform and can use AI to become more competitive with other freight providers, if they can, can continue to have pricing power and raise prices faster than inflation across uh, their, de their mobility business and delivery continues to go up, this feels to me like a company that is absolutely on the right path. China's factory activity declined in October due to the government's tight control on COVID outbreaks. The Purchasing Managers Index, which measures factory production, employment, and inventory, fell from 50.1 in September to 49.2. That might not seem like much, but any reading below 50 indicates that these activities are contracting. And despite that troubling drop, President Xi Jinping has doubled down on his zero COVID policy. During China's twice a decade National People's Congress, Xi Jinping said that China was waging a, quote, all out people's war to stop the spread of the virus, and that he would put, quote, the people and their lives above all else. He also made no mention of how this was all stifling economic growth or its impact on the markets. Scott, what do you make of this? Yeah, I think this is really fascinating. And I think we have a lot to learn uh, from China. And specifically, we don't learn from China at our own risk. And we immediately assign China as a substandard nation, that as a human rights violator, which they are. But there's no denying, if you were to try and find the most impressive feats of mankind over the last century, it might be pushing back on fascism in the middle of the last century, or vaccines, or eliminating smallpox, or communications, whatever it might be. Right up there would be China bringing a half a billion people out of poverty mm. in just a few decades. That's just an enormous feat. Poverty is a disease. It's a terrible way to live. And the fact that they have brought 500 million people from lower income households into middle income households is just an enormous feat. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the Chinese stock market, all right, it's off 34% year to date versus the Dow off 12%. The Hang Seng is the second worst performing major global index after Russia's. And in the average forward PE ratio of stocks in the S&P 500 is 15 times versus the Hang Seng at five times. And essentially what the CCP and Xi have said is that We've, I think, we've looked at America and we've looked at these individuals who amass so much wealth they become more powerful than government. No to that. We look at companies that collect a ton of data and have more insight into consumer patterns than we, the government. No, we're not down with that. We look at entire sectors that may be helping just rich people, such as the tutoring industrial complex. No, we don't like that. And they are willing to kneecap the markets. 
and even dampen their own economy if it means putting what they believe is the right version of their society first, which oftentimes includes control or command and control from the CCP. So it's just interesting that we're all about dollars first, we're all about the markets first, and the CCP has said, no, we're all about China slash the CCP slash the middle class first. I think it's fascinating. They're sort of decoupling, which is a little bit dangerous for us. Um, relationships haven't been this cold and frosty with China in a long time. And some of that is that they don't appear to, uh, and some of that is they appear to have disentangled from this Western capitalist um, focus on the dollar and economic growth model at any cost. So I think it's fascinating what's going on there. And uh, as it relates to COVID though, the observation I would make is that when COVID or when the novel coronavirus was highly lethal and not that contagious, total lockdowns made sense. Now that the virus appears to have morphed a bit and is less lethal but more contagious, uh, total lockdowns don't make sense. I think this. I think it was the right strategy uh, two years ago. I think it's the wrong strategy now, and it's having negative impacts on the mental health of Chinese citizens, their dissatisfaction with government, and also I think it's going to cost them economically. Yeah, it feels like there's this trade-off here, which is you can either let the market do its thing and you harm some people in the process maybe, or you can take control and you can crack down on protecting your people and your nation and your unity, but then you sort of hurt profits in the process. Um, where do you stand here? Because you're often a pretty big proponent of big government. You generally appreciate when government steps in and says, no, that's enough. We don't care if corporations take a cut. Um, but is there a line? Has he gone too far? What do you think? You know, I don't know. I think they've gone too far in terms of their zero COVID policy. There are a quarter of a billion people under full or partial lockdown in China right now. That's one in six people. Mm -hmm. And those lockdowns are in areas responsible for almost a quarter of the GDP of China. And Wuhan reported 25 new infections last week, prompting the CCP to lock down, get this, 900,000 people. And just for context, China reported 1,321 cases one day last week, and NYC locked 2,400 new cases one day this week. So they're taking a much more severe approach to this. I think that's a mistake. Whether or not it's a mistake to uh, trade off their vision of a great society at the cost of markets, I don't know. But I think it's something we should look at, and that is it's just, an imps it's just a really interesting contrast that almost everything we do here, whether it's a COVID bailout package, which I see as the market's bailout package, to laws, to our obsession with the markets, to the American dream to go public and get fabulous wealth through either investing in the market or trading, they have decided pretty severely that no, we're not a market-driven or markets-driven economy, if you will. The test of time will tell whether it was a good or a bad move. In the short run, it's bad for the world because you know, because U.S. Sino relations are at a low, and when the two largest economies in the world get cross-eyed, it's just not—it's not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. It also feels like I mean, you were talking about China's ability to just make decisions very quickly and exert control, but it feels like the only way that that's possible is if you have a, an authoritarian leader, a dictator, and one of the biggest things we saw out of the National People's Congress, which we mentioned is that Xi Jinping has decided to reinstate himself as president for a third term. And that's unprecedented. In 1982, Deng Xiaoping, the president at the time, he implemented a limit of two terms to prevent another Mao-style presidency. And Xi Jinping has just scrapped that and said, no, I'm in charge. I know that you think that term limits are really important. Do you think this is something that we should be considering as well? Power corrupts, absolute power absolutely corrupts. Term yeah. limits are a danger. Uh, you know, the same thing happened in Russia, and look where that's got us. So I think this is just, I think it's terrible. Power literally makes, and there's science around this, makes people stupider, and they start getting more risk aggressive, and they become out of touch. You know, this 82-year-old Khomeini who is ordering his thugs to beat women in the streets, you know, I, you need turnover, you need churn, and you not only need it for your own society, but you need it to uh, understand younger people because like every other autocracy, you end up with some really old man who's out of touch making decisions that affect his populace. So it's a shame. Anytime you see term limits go away, 
in a democracy or an autocracy, it's bad for the country and it's bad for the planet. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe the markets are reacting to that, that they're realizing, okay, we've got a guy who's just we've got a dictator he's going to he's going to decide the entire fate of the country and now we can't invest it's all part of the same narrative and yeah. that is the ccp opting for autocracy and power to the ccp uh, over what the world thinks of their markets and whether or not they think it's a good place to invest in they knew when he uh, blew by term limits or recalibrated term limits or did away with them that the markets are that there'd be less foreign money invested into china mm -hmm. and they decided they don't care Okay, thanks, Scott. Let's take a look at the week ahead. We've got earnings from Lyft, Disney, Rivian, and Roblox. And we're also watching the midterms on Tuesday and inflation data for October on Thursday. Do you have any predictions, Scott? Well, we already made our prediction. Lyft is acquired within the next 12 months. It makes no sense as an independent company. And... Uh, just as exciting, my Deadpool 2 costume came today. Everybody tells me I look like Ryan Reynolds after he survived a horrific fire. That's, mm. that's who I am, Ryan Reynolds post a massive, um, severe burn. Or Ryan Reynolds uh, so with I got a that mask on, maybe. Yeah, there yeah. you go, there you go. <laughs> but I'm excited about that. So my prediction is definitely next year, in exactly 11 months, three weeks, and two days, I will be Deadpool. That's all for this episode. Our producers are Claire Miller and Jason Stavers. Special thanks to Catherine Dillon, Ed Elson, and the Prop G Media team. If you like what you heard, please follow, download, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Prop G Markets. We will catch you next week.